All right, good morning, Doc D, back from the dead. <laughs> That's what it feels like. Uh, so this is uh, the seventh video in the uh, aftermath of the COVID-19 scenario here at Taylor University. And so uh, the topic of today's lecture will be writing good requirements. Uh, the last several lectures have talked about um, uh, design and top level requirements and a lot of that good stuff and uh, so we're going to focus today on how to write good requirements and what what those actually are what what is it what does it mean to be a good requirement and so hopefully this will be helpful uh, we've got a few slides that are uh, reviews um, just to kind of tie it all together for you and so so we all remember Crosby, um, who had his Crosby's Four Absolutes, which I think is probably on the next slide. Uh, so quality is conformance to requirements. All right? And so quality is not goodness, elegance, luxury, excellence. It's something that is objective, that five different people can walk in and they can all arrive at the same conclusion. Um, if it were subjective, um, then it's much more difficult uh, to figure out when, when you've actually achieved this quality thing. Um, so quality can be measured if the requirement is written correctly, and that's the goal of today's uh, lecture. Uh, yeah, and, and again, you know, we can defend our product because we can point out why we did what we did. And so, you know, I had an interesting conversation uh, with a friend of mine uh, who is self-employed and does... Uh, programming for for people and uh, he and his father do this together and they had bid uh, a project for somebody and he was adamant he says you know we absolutely have to have benchmark testing as part of this simply because this way we can prove that you know what they they contracted for us to write that we did write that and that it did work and uh, I thought that was that was really kind of insightful to me because I'd never really thought of it like that. Um, but uh, you know, especially for software programming. But you know, it's it's very true. And so if you if you have good requirements and that you know are objective, then you absolutely can say yes, it did meet those requirements. And so you know, especially in today's uh, society where anybody can sue anybody for anything, you know, being able to say quantifiably look this was the requirement and this is how we met it and being able to prove that all right so what is the implication of that is that you know we have to spend uh, a lot of time and a lot of effort on writing those actual requirements and so as we go through the the lecture today you know what we're going to find is that a lot of times when the customer comes in they really don't know what they need they 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 think they know but they don't they, they don't really know what it is exactly that they need. They have this vague idea of what it is that they, that they, they want, uh, but they don't know exactly what it is. All right. And then perform exactly as required or officially change the requirement. Um, so if you can't meet the requirement, then, you know, you're either not going to be able to do it or you need to go back and, and negotiate with the customer to change that requirement. All right. And then enables and accountability. Uh, workers to management, suppliers to consumers, um, all the way up and down the chain. So again, good stuff. So uh, you know, just again as a, a um, refresher, Crosby had his four absolutes. Number one, when we just talked about the definition of quality is conformance requirements, not goodness. And again, you know, this must be objective, not subjective. All right, system of quality is prevention, not appraisal. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time last week uh, going through those lectures on uh, prevention. And again, I will reiterate this probably for the 50th time that, you know, while you have to have a, a prevention policy, you also have to have an appraisal policy that works hand in hand with that. All right, we talked about the performance standard of zero defects and how. In some industries, that is at, that is an absolute thing. We can't have defects, you know, such as the airline industry. 
and then the measurement of quality is the price of nonconformance. Um, and that's the number four there. That's probably our uh, our second tenet of our, our lectures today is that if we don't get this right, then there is a price to pay. And so that price might be uh, litigation, i.e. where we have to hire attorneys to defend, defend ourselves, um, loss in uh, customer confidence, loss in market share, uh, a lot of different things. So we have to get it right, all right, and we have to get it right the first time. All right, so we'll go ahead and move on here. So <coughs> we spent... Um, we talked about the, the V diagram for uh, the design where we, we actually looked at the top level system requirements and broke those down and then we built everything back up and, and tested from the base component to the next component level to the next uh, subcomponent level all the way back up to the system level. All right. And so hopefully that kind of instilled upon you, upon you that design is a process and it is a thoughtful process. And we, we um, you're going to spend a whole lot of time in the design phase. And I would even hazard to say that you probably will spend 25 to 30 percent of your time in the design phase, getting it right the first time. If the more time that you spend mapping things out to make sure that you really know where you're going, um, the better it's going to be overall. Now, are, are we going to be able to avoid any of the hiccups or mistakes that we get um, as we go? No, we, you will not be able to avoid those. But if we spend a lot of time and a lot of effort and resources right up front in the design process, all right, then things are going to flow so much better. And we'll actually be better able to answer those hard questions when they come up. All right. Uh, emphasis should be on solving the right problem for the customer. I've got a couple slides in here later on that kind of uh, uh, that kind of illustrate that that issue. And again, like I said, a lot of times when customers come in, they really don't know what it is that they want or need. Well, they might know what they want, but is that really what they need? All right. And so that that can be problematic. That that whole. Um, communication factor with the customer to understand exactly what it is that they think they want versus what they actually need and then what we're going to be able to write requirements for all right and then just as a review you know the system design process wow who feels like a monday morning design process flows from system design to component level design as more details are added all right so again uh, and I've talked about this several times, and, and this is one of the problems that um, I see within our engineering program here at Taylor, is that students typically will start on working on the smallest component, and then they build up, right? And for some things, that's okay, but if we're looking at a system and systems design, that's absolutely the wrong thing to do. And I see it almost on a daily basis in that students will basically engineer themselves into a corner because they started that small component and they made it work with the next component and now they're trying to make that work with the next component and then they get to a point where it, it's no longer workable it's no longer tenable and so what do they do uh, you know and so it's it it's it's almost uh, comic in watching it play out but I see it all the time and so again if we think back to that V diagram, you know, we had so this way had the top level system requirements, all right, and we start breaking that down and get all the way down to the to the smallest requirements, right? And then we start building it back up, all right? If we've done it that way, then we know how everything nests within itself. And then when we start designing it back again, all right? We, we already know where we're going and we, we have a general idea of how things must work um, within the framework of the system as well as within the framework of that small component to subcomponent, subcomponent to the next higher component uh, level. All right. So, again, this is, this is all stuff that, you know, I, I see on a regular basis and um, I, I, 
really think that you know we, we need to uh, instill this way of thinking in our young engineers, and I'm still working on that. Um, so, for for those of you who might be thinking about becoming engineers, uh, this will be a topic for uh, the MP 104 class, uh, which is the introduction to engineering. All right, I'll get off my soapbox now. Sorry. <laughs> All right, so a design process. Um, so here we have just a little flow chart that kind of encapsulates that whole thing um, that we just talked about. Oh, well, that's not very good. You're cut off. Uh, yeah, most of it's there, uh, enough to talk about. So again, you know, at the start, we become aware of the need. All right, we interview the customer. We state the problem requirements, and then we review that with the, cl with the client. All right. And is, are they properly stated? If not, then we go back, we talk to the client again to refine what those requirements are. And, and this, is, this is iterative. I mean, you know, to go through this only once it rarely happens. I mean, unless it's somebody who really absolutely has developed a lot of uh, time and resources to understanding what it is that they need. So once we finally get this solved, all right, then we're actually going to move into how do we actually approach the design problem? So, you know, analyze the problem, expand or refine requirements, you know, are there different ways that we can address those? All right. And then we're going to go right back to the customer again to say, hey, you know, here's what we've come up with so far. What are your thoughts? Um, does this jive with what you think? Is this workable for you? And it may not be. Um, so we have to get that customer input and we have to listen to them and we have to communicate clearly and concisely all right so if the customer agrees yeah okay that that particular alternative or that all other alternative works or maybe all of them work all right then we're going to move forward we're going to make a conceptual design and then again the customer comes in uh, that's number 11 there is uh, the conceptual design <coughs> we'll reserve review that with the customer yet again all right, if the customer likes it, then we can move forward into production. If they don't, we go back and we redo it all over again. All right, so that just that bothers me that you can't see the whole thing. At least I can on my screen. Maybe you can. Somebody leave a comment and let me know that if you can actually see um, the whole thing. Because I'm, I'm not able to see it in my window, which is crazy. I don't know why I wouldn't be able to see it, but I can't. So hopefully it's just an artifact. All right, moving on. All right, so we got definition, analysis. All right, so today we're actually talking about this definition stage, how we're actually defining what it is that, that our client needs. Not necessarily what they want, what they need. All right, and then after after the analysis you know then we when we start getting into you know developing all right so the iterative design process uh, we actually do talk about this in the EMP 104 class and uh, but we we're not given enough background as far as writing good requirements and, and the whole um, system design so there are a lot of different iterative design theories, models, whatever you want to call them out there, all right, and so they all have some similarities, and again, you know, depending upon who you're talking to, one's better than the other. I don't know that any one is better than the other. Uh, I, I will say that having a process is much better than not, all right, and so typical steps, uh, we complete an initial design, all right, and so if we went back there, you know, how do we arrive at that initial design? And so this is this is kind of what has been going on with our EMP 104 students is that they they get this introduction to iterative design here, all right, and we don't talk about the front end of that, which was that this whole defining the problem, right, and then the whole analysis, all right. Well, after we get through with all of this definition we define the problem and then we analyze the problem uh, expand and refine requirements discover alternatives right all right and do a conceptual design okay so this is where 
our students come in. And so, you know, it's not their fault that this is this is what they've been taught to this date. But we, we need to out, we need to update how we teach this so that they get the front end of this, because otherwise they're jumping into this thing midstream and it doesn't work out real well for them. OK, so once we've done all that preliminary work of actually identifying the requirements and analyzing and defining the problem and, and possible solutions. All right. Then we go to that initial design. All right. So once we get to that point, we're going to present the initial design to several de you know, t several different test users. OK, so beta testing. We're picking people uh, probably you, at this point. It's usually technical people to say, hey, um, here it is. See if you can break it. Um, make uh, suggestions for what might be useful, uh, so forth and so on. All right. So at this point, again, you know, we're, we're we're asking technical people to look at it. All right. And then we're we're going to note any problems, and then you know, some of them are probably acceptable. Others will require that we do a refinement of it. All right. And then we're just going to keep iterating, iterating through this this process, all right, and, until we get to the point where, you know, the problems that we're discovering are, are not catastrophic. Okay. And, and then you know this this isn't the end. All right. So once we get you know the beta testing out there, then we're going to do a limited introduction to um, non-technical people. And this is where things really get exciting because the non-technical people, they don't have any idea what they're doing. And so they do things that are outside the scope of what we would ever think of someone trying. And that's where you really discover <laughs> a lot of errors that, you know, were unintentional that you had no idea were there. But the technical people aren't going to find them because they actually know what they're doing. And they have an idea of the scope of what this is supposed to be doing. And they're usually trying to act within the scope of that. All right. Well, you give this to non-technical people, they don't have any idea what they're doing. They're just playing with it. They're just they're trying to make it work with their limited understanding of how it should work. And so they do all kinds of weird stuff. And this is where you really find a lot of your problems. All right, moving on. Uh, this probably should have been back uh, two or three lectures ago, but that's okay. All right, so our goal for today, wow, we've already spent 15 minutes, no, almost 20 minutes, uh, in a review, but that's good. This is all good stuff. I, I hope that you're finding it good stuff uh, because I do. I, I, I find this very interesting and uh, I don't care who you are, at some point in time in your life, you are going to encounter a problem where you have to design a solution. And that might be at your own home, it might be at your work, uh, it might, who knows. But everybody has to solve problems. And so if you look at these in a systematic process it makes it's going to make your life so much easier and you're going to have a lot more success in being able to solve your problem all right so moving on uh, so for goal for today is learn how to write good requirements whoa wrong way uh, probably the most important part of the system design all right and, and i i think that is hugely important because uh, a few slides ago says, you know, solving the right problem for the customer. Well, that's that's it. I mean, that's it in a nutshell. We have to actually, and, and again, a lot of times the customer has no idea. They have no clue what their actual problem is. They think they know, but they don't. They don't really know. All right. Um, so if we don't understand what the requirement if what the what the customer needs and we're not able to write good requirement statements then we're going to wind up with a substan the odds are that we're going to wind up with a substandard uh, product all right so we build everything off of these requirements so if the requirements are wrong they're inaccurate or they're ir inadequate then our product is going to be that very same thing it's going to be inaccurate inadequate so forth and so on all right. So we saw a slide very similar to this, uh, and, and I'll throw that up here again here in a second. All right. But the cost of requirements errors. All right. And so, again, if we identify a problem while we're writing requirements, it literally costs nothing. All right. It's just part of doing business. 
All right. So the more time that we spend there, even though we might spend double the time, the dollar expenditure is very, very minimal. All right. When we get into the design components uh, stage of this, it's a five-fold increase in the, in the cost of changes, all right? Because we've started making things. We're starting to use raw materials. We're acquiring machines. We're acquiring raw materials. We're training workers. Um, we're buying tooling, all right? And so the cost of a change there, while not exorbitantly expensive, it's a whole lot more expensive than we're on the pen and paper um, side of things. All right, we go up to the build phase, and so now we've got a conceptual design, and hey, we're actually building, you know, a, a real model of this. And again, this is a limited scope production. We're only we're only going to make a small number of whatever it is. All right, the cost of discovering an error there, ten times what it would be from requirements. And I think these numbers are very uh, conservative. I, I think they're much much more expensive than that. And, and I, yeah, yeah, much, much more expensive. All right, so we get to the unit test. So, okay, we build a small number of these, and uh, they've gone out, and, you know, we're doing beta testing, and people are discovering errors. Well, now it's a 20-fold increase in cost to make changes compared to if we had discovered that early on in the requirements. All right, the acceptance test, okay, so now... Uh, we, we've gone from our technical people and now we're putting out, you know, uh, a small amount of these to actual users to, you know, do their thing, to tear things up because they don't have any idea what they're doing. 50-fold increase, all right? Well, if we were really lax and we went through all of this and we failed to capture a requirements error, all right, and we get to the... It's been released. We're actually in full blown, full blown production of this. Two hundred times more expensive, and, and I, I think that's very, very conservative. It's probably more like two thousand, maybe even more. All right. So, really, really important that we identify uh, re this, the correct requirements early on, and that you know we build everything from those correct requirements. And again, if we if we don't, if we miss them out there, very, very expensive to correct. All right, our next slide. All right, so again, we, we've already seen this, all right, and, and so we see a uh, very similar curve here in that, you know, uh, if we uh, discover an error in the design phase, it's really no cost, all right development a little bit more expensive testing a little bit more expensive and then deployment you know a hundred times more thousand times more whatever it is all right <clears throat> and so these are two different uh, 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 sets of uh, graphs data points from two different people so this one I think is from HP uh, I don't remember what the other one was from uh, Managing software by uh, Dean Leffingwell and Don Widrig. All right. Uh, so, again, you know, uh, HP is, you know, they're making hardware. Uh, the other slide, you know, is from a company that does uh, um, software design. All right. Let's see here. Oh. All right. So, as I've stated several times here that, you know, a lot of times the customer comes in and they, they, they have a general idea of what it is that they want, but they don't really know what it is that they need. All right. And so we'll, we'll do this exercise. And so I just want you to close your eyes and to picture a dog. All right. And uh, so... This is an exercise that I do in class, and actually, I think I may have already done this exercise uh, with this class. I, I don't remember. It's all kind of blurring together now. All right. But if I were to go around the room now and ask each person, hey, uh, you know, what, what dog did you have? 
you know, and somebody would have uh, a German Shepherd, and somebody might have a Rottweiler, and somebody might have a Datsun, and then, um, you know, I have a, a couple of friends who are just deathly afraid of dogs, and, you know, if I ask them, what did you picture, you know, it'd be some dog that's all teeth and slavering jaws and a whole nine, whole nine yards, you know, uh, so everybody so you know we say the word dog and, and we all have a different picture of that you know my own dog's a german shepherd uh, and then you know my better half her dog is a schnoodle and uh, so you know we all have a different picture in our mind even though it's it's a probably one of the most common words you know three letters dog d-o-g which happens to be my one of my early dogs d-o-g <laughs> Interesting tidbit. <laughs> you guys are probably tired of my humor. But oh, well. I'm trying to have fun with this. I hope you are, too. Uh, so we have to be careful of what we say, and we have to refine what we say uh, to be descriptive <clears throat> and very descriptive. All right? uh, so I have a, a series of little uh, cartoon uh, caricatures here that depict uh, how this process typically goes and, and, I, and I really do feel like you know these these are pretty accurate right okay so here we go uh, <laughs> it is important to write down and agree upon requirements absolutely all right so the customer comes in and they're explaining the problem you know this is what we need and so you know you're looking at it and you're like I have no idea why you need a swing with three different seats, but okay, you know, all right, I got gotcha. you. We can do this. All right. <laughs> and I don't know who wrote these cartoons, but they, they really do. They really do sum it up very well. All right, moving on here. So, so our project leader, you know, we, we, we talk about the what the customer is looking for, and this is what he comes up with, you know. It's like, okay, yeah, all right. So then the analyst, he gets involved and is like, yeah, oh, we can make this work. <laughs> and, and, and then the programmer gets involved, and, and you know, this is his result. <laughs> Shoot. All right, so how the project was documented, all right, I really should have probably three or four slides on this. Now, you have to document what you're doing, all right. Again, in today's society, everything, uh, uh, you know, we're very uh, sue happy. Litigation is an everyday fact of life, and so... We have to document what those requirements are. We have to document that the customer accepted them. As we go through our design process, we have to document everything. All right, and, and I will tell you that, um, you know, from my own personal experience, uh, I do a lot of tinkering, and, and so you know, I've, I've rebuilt several uh, computer numerical control machines and so forth and so on, um, and. Uh, you have to document. You have to document. Not only for the, the fear of litigation, but also, you know, you always need to be thinking about what if that key person who is designing this gets run over by a bus tomorrow, all right? What happens, you know? How do you pick up the threads from where that person was? Or they decide midstream of your design, of your project design that, they get a better offer from somebody else, and they're gone. So we have to document. The more thorough your documentation is, the better it is. If you're ever sued, you can show that you absolutely, objectively did meet the requirements. You actually identified the requirements. The customer approved the requirements. And then as you design the build, and so if you do find an error later and you have great documentation, it's very, very easy to go back and see where that uh, divergence happened and go back to that point and make some small minuscule changes to make it work. All right. But if you don't have good documentation, <clears throat> you're going to be hurting. 
All right, just point of fact. All right. <laughs> what operations installed? Yeah, and there, it seems like, yeah, th there always is a disconnect between the different um, departments within a company. You know, if we went back to that previous slide, you know, how the project leader understood it, how the analyst designed it, how the programmer wrote it. You know, so we have some commonalities between all these threads, but there's no continuity from one to the other. All right. And that's that's really what we're trying to do is, is we're writing requirements that make it so it's almost impossible to design something outside of that. All right. <laughs> How the custom was built. Yeah. <laughs> You designed it, you asked us to build you a tree swing, and we built you a roller coaster. That's how we're building this, All right? <laughs> and then how it was supported. All right, so, yeah, these, literally these four slides. Actually, we have a fifth slide that will be really important here. They really sum it all up, all right? So if you miss the boat on something, all right, you absolutely has to have super customer support. And, you know, you have to go the extra nine yards. Otherwise, again, the cost of nonconformance is what? You're going to lose your market share. You're going to lose customer confidence. And ultimately, you know, you're probably going to go under because nobody wants to buy your products because you're not designing good stuff. All right. All right, what the customer really needed. Well, Again, we thought this first picture is what they really needed, but voila, there is what the customer was looking for, all right? And so, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, the customer, nine times out of ten, doesn't really know exactly what it is that they want, all right? They've got this idea, but they don't really know what it is. Can't stress that enough. Got another. Okay. So, what is a good requirement? All right. And so, we'll talk about smart requirements here in a little bit. All right. Um, measurable. Okay. We want to be more in the quantitative. All right. Qualitative versus quantitative. What's the difference? Well, um, I actually am a qualitative social science scientist uh, in that uh, how does something make you feel? Um, and so those are very, very subjective things. Uh, and, and I'm not saying that they are not important because, you know, even though we, we hit the mark with what the meeting the, the customer's actual requirements, right, um, that's all great and fine. We also want to have some qualitative measurement in there, too. And that's why you get, you know, if you buy a new car, you get surveys from the, from the manufacturer saying, tell us about your Toyota experience, you know. And I, and I say this because I bought a new Toyota truck this year. And, uh, like, weekly I'm getting bombarded with, <coughs> excuse me, uh, surveys. You know, tell us about your experience. All right, because they are interested in that qualitative. But... In all honesty, you know, when it breaks, when you get right down to it, we really want to be quantitative, all right? Because quantitative is, it's breakdown to yes, no, specific numbers, specific benchmarks, all right? Those, those are quantitative, you know, they're measurable and they're testable, and we'll talk about repeatable and time-based and all that good stuff here in a minute, all right? <laughs> so, not the boat should go straight, all right? Which sounds like, you know, oh, uh, we're designing the boat and it should go straight. Well, that, that seems that seems good. Uh, when rowed towards a fixed object, the boat should go straight. All right. Another, I think this is the far side one. Uh, where'd it go? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about kind of the syntax and structure of good requirements. All right, complete sentences, 
subject, first predicate, not just single words, collections of acronyms. Okay, we really want to spell this out. We want to be specific and precise in what we say. Requirements can either be mandatory or desirable. Okay, so obviously we want to address mandatory things first. It must do this or it shall do that. All right. So when we're designing something, you know, we're going to look at those mandatory uh, requirements and we're going to flesh those out. All right. So uh, terms that we use for that, shall and must. All right. Now, um, we also have the desirables. All right. And so... A lot of times, you know, the, the customer will say, well, it must do this, and it'd be nice if it did this, this, and this. All right. So, you know, here's, here's an example. Uh, this, it, it must accept or it shall accept $1 bills. And then, hey, you know, as, as an afterthought, if it could accept $5 bills, great. You know, that, that would be a plus. All right. And I already kind of said this, I, I at least alluded to it, clear, unambiguous, and not confusing, all right? Again, we want to be very precise in what we say. We want to express it in the customer's terms and jargon. And this is, this is hard, all right? Um, so if a customer comes in from a specific manufacturing area, whatever, uh, they have a set of acronyms and jargon that they use. All right, and so a common term there might not be the same. They might not have the same understanding of that that you do, or you may not have the same understanding that they do. All right, but we want to make sure that we, we're all speaking the same language, all right? And so, again, we need to understand what it is exactly that the customer is, is saying. We need to identify who it is specifically um, that we're writing this for. All right, and so, you know, when, when a customer comes to you with a complex system to be designed, you know, there might be six or seven different key players in there who are uh, developing this. And, and so we want to make sure that, um, you know, we're talking with those key people to make sure that we're getting straight from them what it is that they need. All right, and I hope that makes sense. All right, uh, make as numeric as possible. Again, you know, we need to be able to quantify this. And so quantification requires numbers, all right, or at least clear, specific benchmarks, um, something that is measurable, all right. And again, you know, um, we, it has to be testable. If it's not testable, then, then we miss the boat. All right. Looks like I'm just about out of time here, so we'll talk about, actually I think I'll just leave it at that, and we will start the next lecture um, with um, the SPART, SMART uh, requirements. Um, so again, uh, all these lectures that I've done uh, since uh, spring break, they, they all kind of dovetail in together. And it's all about uh, developing a quality product and how we do that uh, as efficiently as possible. And so, anyhow, I hope that this is helpful for you. Uh, if you have comments or questions, please he don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, you can drop a comment on the channel or uh, send me an email, and uh, I will be sure to answer those. Uh, so, Doc D out. I hope you have a pleasant day. Thanks.